beautiful people. Hello. I'm going to try and record this for those who are absent, so we'll see how that works. Um, but go ahead and take out your notes. We're going to review chapter four. Tomorrow is your test. Keep that in mind. And I'm going to be going through some select questions off of the are you ready that I'm noticing that you guys are, are slightly struggling with. So I want to make sure that we're solid. And then uh, we, we are available for tutoring during lunch. We, as in, I think Ms. Ledesma is available for lunch. I'm available during lunch. And then tomorrow before school, I am also available if you need that last minute crunch. All right. Let's go ahead and start off with simplifying. There are one, two, three, four ish questions that will be instructed. You'll be instructed to simplify. First one is a radical, so a cube root of 448 times x to the seventh power, y to the seventh power. Now, again, there's different ways of doing this. If you want to keep everything as a radical, that's fine. I usually convert mine into fractions, especially when it comes to the variables. So I'm going to split everything up. I got the cube root of 448 times the cube root of x to the seventh power times the cube root of y to the seventh power. From here, I'm going to find out two numbers that are perfect cubes, or at least one of them is a perfect cube, right? And then when I multiply those two numbers, that give me 448. If you're struggling to find your perfect squares, perfect cubes, perfect fourths, whatever they are, give yourself a little thinking bubble. And then in that thinking bubble, go write out your stuff. So I have cube root of 8 is 2. Cube root of 27 is 3. And I'm kind of creating a little cheat sheet for myself that I can then go back and use my, test out my numbers. So the number we have is 448. Let's see how much more I have to go. I'm going to stop here just because I'm out of space. Hopefully one of them actually works. And so we're going through 448 divided by, I'm going to start out with 216, that doesn't work, then I'll go down to 64, 7. So we get 64 times 7, that's my two numbers, but we know that the cube root of 64 is 4, so we can simplify that. So we got 4 times the cube root of 7. That's what I do for the numerics. Now, for the variables, I actually convert them to a rational exponent. So I say 7, sorry, x to the 7th power. I have y to the 7th power. And so our denominator is our index of 3. From here, I get to simplify our fraction. So I look at a, the largest number uh, that can be divisible by 3 that's inside of 7. So for us, I have 6 thirds. And left over is 1 third because 6 plus 1 is 7. Same thing here with our y's. It's exactly the same because we have the same exponent of 7 thirds. Simplify your fractions. So we get x squared here. This one stays as 1 third. We get y squared here. And this one stays at 1 third. The important thing is when you have a uh, fractional exponent, a rational exponent, that means this is a radical. So the number on top is always the exponent. The number in the denominator is always your index. So we have here 4 times the cube root of 7 times x squared times the cube root of x to the first power times y squared times the cube root of y to the first power. Now this is incorrect format. Please don't give me your answer like that because anything that shares the same index with multiplication needs to be in the same bubble or in the same radical. Anything that's not needs to be in front of the radical. So your final answer is x to the, just kidding, x squared, so 4x squared 
y squared, so 4x squared y squared, that's gone. And then we have inside the cube root a 7, an x, and a y for our final answer. Okay. Does anyone have questions on this one here? Good. As always, beautiful people, as we're working through these, try to work ahead of me, see if we get the same answer. That way, if I make a mistake, you can always call me out on that. You know that. All right, let's do the next simplify. Next simplify is, once again, a cube root of 40 over 625. This is going off of your quotient property. Do you know how to handle a quotient property? Whenever you have a fraction on the inside of a radical, you can use the quotient property to split that up. So you have a cube root on top and a cube root in the denominator. Now for a cube root of 625, I don't think that's a pretty number. Uh, you can check on a calculator using the, uh, the exponent, fraction exponent, rational exponent if you want or you're gonna have to split it up just like we did before. I'm gonna choose to split it up. I already have my cubes in front of me here. So number, I'm thinking 125. Oops, I typed that in wrong. 625 divided by 125, that gives me five. So we have cube root of 125 times the cube root of five. In the denominator, gives me 625. And then here, I'm thinking eight and five. Simplify that out, we have a cube root of eight, that is just two. Cube root of five, that doesn't work. And some of you already see what, where we're going with this, but we'll just get there a little bit slower here. So we got the cube root of 125, which is five. And then we got cube root of five as well. This can only happen because it, you do have multiplication and division. There is no subtraction and multiplication and or multiplication. But anytime you only have multiplication, things just work out. So if you see a cube root of five on top and a cube root of five on the bottom, yes, you can simplify that to one because you're dividing the same thing uh, top and bottom. But again, this can only work when you have multiplication. This does not work when you have addition or subtraction. So we have our answer, simplified answer of just two fifths. Uh, for something like this, make sure I'm going to put a little note here. When you're dividing, make sure you know how to rationalize the denominators. That will come up. And I'm just writing that in. So make sure to know how to rationalize denominators. So just because this one worked out pretty doesn't mean the other ones will. Moving on to the next one. Speaking of rationalizing the denominator, let's rationalize the denominator. So we have 4 over 8 minus the square root of 3. 4 over 8 minus the square root of 3. Notice this is a binomial. And whenever you have a binomial in your denominator, you're going to have to multiply by the conjugate. So to multiply by the conjugate, you're going to multiply 8 root 3, top and bottom, but the middle symbol is going to be changed. So originally we have a subtraction here, so we need to make it into addition. So we got to flip the sign. In your numerator, you have a monomial, so one thing being multiplied by a binomial, two things. So you're going to have to distribute that four inward. Here, in the, numer oh, sorry, in the denominator, you have a pattern. Typically, what I like to see uh, is you guys separate this out so you guys can show me your steps separately. You don't have to do that, but it does make it easier. So for your denominator pattern, you have a squared minus b squared. And for your numerator, you are going to be distributing out that 4.
So you got 8 times 4, which is 32. And then we have just 4 root 3 here. This is in our numerator. I'm just going to put a box around it. That's not our answer. That's just what's in our numerator. For your denominator, we have an 8 squared minus root 3 squared. So we have 64 minus 3, which gives us a 61. Again, I'm going to put a little box around it. That's not our answer. That's just the denominator. And so for our final answer, we're going to combine the numerator and denominator. In our numerator, we have 32 plus 4 root 3. In our denominator, we have 61. Now, the only time that you can actually simplify uh, something like this is if you factor out a number out of 32, out of 4, and out of 61. That is the only time that you can factor things out like this. Uh, right now, with 61, we can't factor anything out from top and bottom, so this is our final answer on that one. Any questions on simplifying like this? Yes, sir. So I do this pattern because this is the difference of squares. If you were to FOIL or box method this out, you would still end up with this. So if you wanted to do it, like if you don't remember the pattern, you have a binomial times a binomial, go in and distribute that out, use a box method, and you still should end up with this. The one thing, the whole point of what we're doing is we cannot have a radical in the denominator. So if you end up with a radical here in the denominator, something went wrong. You've got to go back and fix it. The numerator, we don't care that there's a radical in the numerator. That's fine. It's just the denominator that we care about. So if you were to do 12, well, it would be 8 minus um, cube 3, and then it would be 8 plus cube 3, and there's 12 like that? Yes. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would be 8 minus cube 3 and then 8 plus cube 3. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. So is there a reason why you put equal divided by 8 plus instead of 8 minus is so it's not equal to a square root? Correct. Yeah. It's kind of like when we were doing conjugates in our previous chapter. We want that to be gone. We want that square root to disappear. And the only way to make that happen is to use the conjugate. Any other questions on that? Great questions. Okay, anyone else need more time? Okay. Let's go ahead and continue with our next simplify. Our next simplify looks like 64. And that's being raised to the two-thirds power. Now, just like in the Are You Ready packet, it did state that if you are not showing your steps, if you're using a calculator, you'll, you're going to get nothing. We're not testing you on if you know how to use a calculator. We're testing you, do you know your properties? Do you know how to handle exponents that are fractions? So for this, you have two options. I repeat, you have two options. You can either... Rewrite it as 64 squared with an index of 3, or you can rewrite it as the cube root of 64 squared. This is testing you on your conversion, going from a radical to a rational exponent, or in this case, rational exponent to a radical. I personally think this is easier, especially that you're you know, being tested on not using a calculator. I don't know what 64 is unless I use a calculator or do it by hand, which I don't want to, right? So this one here, the cube root of 64 is, anyone can tell me that already off the top of their head? Four, four good, yeah. And then you just have four squared, which is 16. So although that looks a little scary, once you break it down and rewrite it, shouldn't be too bad. So that's going to be something that you're going to see tomorrow on the test for your simplifying section. And then let's jump into solving equations. You're going to see equations with a rational exponent so a fraction exponent, and you're going to see equations with radicals. You need to know how to handle both. Negative 215 is equal to negative parentheses r plus 20 raised to the 3 halves power 
plus 1. Whenever you have a rational exponent or a radical, you want to get that by itself. You want to isolate what we call a bubble. So everything that is not raised to a power needs to be gone. So I am going to subtract 1. So we have negative 216 is equal to a negative r plus 20 raised to the 3 halves power. Again, anything not raised to the power needs to be removed, so we need to remove that negative, so we're going to divide by a negative 1. So we end up having a positive 216 is equal to r plus 20 raised to the 3 halves power. Now this step right here, as long as you remember this step, let the calculator do the thinking for you, you're, you're in good hands. Whenever you have an exponent that's a fraction, the easiest way to get rid of it is do not rewrite this as a radical. Instead, you're going to raise both sides, bless you, and I'm doing the caret just to show you that, hey, we are really taking, you know, this is a power, but you're raising both sides by the reciprocal. So this ends up being a power with a power, okay, an exponent with an exponent, and we multiply those together, which means the threes go away, the twos go away, and you're ending up with an exponent of one. So we have r plus 20 raised to the first power, which is just r plus 20, it goes away. Now on this side here, as long as you type it into your calculator correctly, you're going to let the calculator do the thinking for you. Make sure that your fraction exponent is in parentheses. If you don't put parentheses on this, it will be giving you a wrong answer. So something, again, looks scary. Calculator gives you just 36. Subtract 20, subtract 20, and we're just left with 16. Again, please be careful on these. Potentially, it's 16. You want to plug that in and triple check. Because you are using a calculator on this section, it's okay to just type it in as long as when you check, make sure you type it in exactly how you see it with the parentheses. But when you type in that three halves, you have to have parentheses around that three halves, otherwise the calculator will give you a wrong answer. And in this case, let's do that really quickly. We have negative parentheses, what did we get? 16 plus 20, raise it to the power of three halves, and it gives me negative to 16, and what did we want? Oh, I forgot to add one. We're still adding one. Plus one? Yeah, and that works out. So, learn from me. Make sure you write the entire thing down when you're checking. Right? So, put a little check mark on there. Again, for the check, I don't actually need to see the check, but you do actually need to do it. It's going to be very obvious when um, I'm going to give you extraneous solutions, and you're going to keep it in your answer. It's proving to me that you didn't check. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next solving equation. Next solving equation, we have 5k minus 36 raised to the 1 half power is equal to k minus 6. Be extremely careful, extremely careful when you see exponents, when you see radicals, when you see numbers. And it sounds silly. It's like, well, we're supposed to be careful with everything. Yes. But a lot of times when you have letters and numbers, variables and numbers, it ends up being a binomial. So we're going to raise both sides to the reciprocal power of 2 over 1. So on the left-hand side, again, the 2's go away, the 1's go away, we're just left with 1, so we have 5k minus 36. However, on the right-hand side, this is where your mind will play tricks on you. This is a binomial squared. Your mind will play tricks on you. To prevent that, do an extra step. Write out the word binomial. Write out the bubble twice. And then once you write out the parentheses twice, you will have your brain kind of make that switch and be like, oh, well, it's not just bringing that two in because that would be silly. This is actually foiling, distributing out your two binomials. You can do box method if you want. I'm just going to distribute that out. We got k squared minus 12k plus 36. Again, this is foiling distribute on that one. 
If you want to use box method, you can use box method on that as well. From here, you're going to move everything to one side. So I'm going to subtract 5K, add 36. We got negative 17K plus uh, 3672. And 72, for some reason, 8 and 9 are coming to, yep, that's it. So we have k minus 8 and k minus 9. Be careful here, beautiful people. If you end up using the rainbow method, you do need to divide. In this case, we did not use the rainbow method. Our leading coefficient is 1, so this is good. So we got k is equal to positive 8, k is equal to positive 9. Maybe we have to check. Okay, we got we to check. Again, how do you check? We well, got to plug it into both sides and make sure they both equal. You can do this again on the calculator, just separately. And then we have the other one with the nine. Can someone plug in the eight one into their calculator and check that both sides are equal? And can someone do the nine, please? Just to save time. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Not necessarily. So you want to add thirty six and then? Were you thinking like GCF? Okay, if, if every single term had a K, then yes, you can divide by K, but that would be still keeping the K as a GCF. This one wouldn't work. Okay, does someone check 8? Did 8? 8 does not work, but it works. Both works? No. They both work? Okay, which one are we, are we uh, debating on? Are we debating on 8 or 9? Okay, well, let's check. It's okay. Let's check. We got 5 parentheses, 8 parentheses, minus 32 parentheses. Make sure that this one half is in parentheses. Otherwise, your calculator will lie to you. I get 2. 8 minus 6 is 2. So that one works out. 8 is good. And then I'm going to go back and quickly do 9. I get 3, 9 minus 6 is 3, 9 works out. Again, the number one hiccup that happens here is not putting that one half in parentheses. Your calculator is smart, but you are smarter. you got to tell it what to do. Otherwise, it'll do whatever it wants to, and that's not always right. Okay, that's solving equations. Now let's solve equations with radicals. Anyone still need this on the board? All right, solving equations with radicals. Let's do a cube root here. Uh, not a cube root, I'm sorry. Let's do a square root. We got the square root of 3x minus 8. Oh, you can't see. There it is. Thank you. Plus 1 is equal to the square root of x plus 5. Something like this, 1,000% guaranteed. I've already written the test. This is on the test. You will have a question like this. Not only do you have to get rid of the radical once, you're going to end up having to get rid of the radical twice. Please make sure to know how to do this question. It will be on the test. Step number one, you want to make sure that both of these are on opposite sides. You do have a plus one here, so you can't just square both sides, even though that's what we're going to do. This one kind of ruins things for us and it prevents it from being an easy question. Why you square Absolutely, we're going to do that, but it's that one is preventing us from having a pretty basic question. And that is because we have a binomial, once again that word, binomial, in that parentheses. We have a binomial with a radical. Now, on that right side, things just work out, right? You have an index of 2, you have an exponent of 2, that goes away. We have x plus 5, not a problem. 
But again, it, on the other side, because of this one, we have a binomial. So we're doing that extra step of writing that bubble twice. Please write out your binomial twice so your brain can make that switch. Otherwise, you're going to think, oh, I'm just going to bring that two in, and you can't do that. So we have the square root of 3x minus 8 plus 1 times the square root of 3x minus 8 plus 1. Now that you see those two bubbles, now that you see your two binomials, your brain makes that switch like, oh, well, now I have to distribute, use the box method, FOIL, whatever makes you, you know, comfortable on that. So I'm going to choose to do a box method. You can choose to do something else. That's fine. Do not split up your radical. Everything that's on the inside stays on the inside. <coughs> Multiply them out. This is just the square root of 3x minus 8 squared, which gives us 3x minus 8. I'm going to circle it so I don't lose it. We have 1 square root of 3x minus 8. We have 1 square root of 3x minus 8. And if you remember your patterns of multiplying um, a, a binomial squared, you can use your patterns that can save some time. And so what we end up having on the left-hand side is 3x minus 8 plus 1 plus 2 square roots of x, 3x, sorry, minus 8. And then on the right-hand side, we still have that x plus 5. Right here, you have a choice to make. You can either simplify these right here by doing minus 8 plus 1 and then rewriting it, then moving the 3. I personally don't do that. I know I need to get everything away from that radical. So what I choose to do is I choose to already move things over. So I'm going to subtract 3x. I'm going to add 8, and I'm going to subtract 1. And I kind of do it all in one step. So we still have that 2 times the radical of 3x minus 8. And then on here, on the right-hand side, we can simplify it and make it look prettier. So we have, what, negative 2x, 5 plus 8 minus 1 gives me 12. Now we're going to, again, make sure that the square root is the only thing there. So I need to get rid of 2. So 2 is attached by multiplication. We are dividing by 2. Now when you divide by 2, every single thing needs to be divided by 2. So we have the square root of 3x minus 8 is equal to negative x plus 6. Once again, we're going to have to square both sides. We've got to undo the square root. When we square, once again, we have a binomial. Write out the word binomial. Write out the bubbles twice. Write out the binomial twice. Otherwise, your brain will play tricks on you, and you're going to make silly mistakes. And this is immense. We spent a lot of time on this question already, so imagine how much points this is going to be worth. A lot. Here, we're now done with the radical. This we have to multiply out. So it is your choice. If you want to FOIL, distribute, I'm going to choose to distribute. We got x squared minus 6 minus 6, so minus 12x plus 36. We're going to subtract 3x, add 8, and factor. If at any moment you're solving this and you are unable to factor, you can always go back to your quadratic formula and solve using the quadratic formula. Uh, what are we looking at? We have 44 and 15. Is that 11 and 4? Yeah. Thank you.
Again, no rainbow method, so I don't need to divide. So that means x is equal to 11 or, and or, x is equal to 4. Both, maybe. One of them, maybe. None of them, maybe. We just have to check. They both work. Can I get a second on they both work? Yeah? Which one does not work? Beautiful people, double check for me. Does 11 work? Someone else double check, does four work? Plug it into the original equation, original. See if they, they equal each other. There you go, it took me a moment. I'm like, where's the original? It's right in front of me. Yes, sir. We just, yeah, so on the calculator, you're just going to do one side at a time. Yeah. So, like, for example, you got the square root of 3. So we're plugging in, I'll do 4, minus 8, plus 1. We're going to get whatever number we get. And then we're going to plug in on the other side, 4, plus 5, and see if it's the same thing. Now, it, if it's a decimal, again, we really don't care that if it's a decimal, we just need to make sure those two sides are balanced, that they're the same thing. So when we type it in, we got the square root of 12 minus 8. We got 2 plus 1, 3. We got 4 plus 5, that's 9. Square root of that, that's 3. So 4 does work. Anyone check 11? Did 11 work? 11 did not work. Okay. Gonna write that out really quick. So we get 16 here, which is 4. And then this one, 3 times 11 minus 8, that's 25. So 11. Uh, how you want to proceed with this, if you want to write out 11 is an extraneous solution, that's fine. If you want to do this, that also makes sense to me. Okay, I understand that you understand that 11 can't be one of your solutions. Okay, so that's solving the equations. Uh, similar to solving the equations, it's solving inequality. When solving an inequality, remember there's three steps. There's three things you have to do. Here's your inequality. 4x plus 8 minus 3 is less than, or yeah, it's less than 1. No equal to, just less than. Step number one, you're going to take the inside and only the inside. You're going to set it equal to 0. You're going to solve for x. I'm going to subtract 8. I got 4x is equal to negative 8. Divide by 4, divide by 4 x is equal to negative 2. What am I doing with that? Right now, nothing. That's just step number one, get your x value. Step number two, you're going to copy down the inequality. However, you're not doing an inequality. You are setting it equal. It's like an equation. And you're going to solve for x just like we did previously. Get everything away from the radical. Square both sides. 4x plus 8 is equal to 16. Solving for x. Thank you. Again, what do we do with that right now? Nothing. Right, we just have our two x values. Uh, we will need them in step number three, which is testing on a number line. You will always end up having uh, three sections. So you're going to have one section from negative infinity to whatever number is smaller. You will have the section in between your two numbers, and then you will have that uh, greater number all the way up to positive infinity. So those are your three potential answers. Just need to test each section to check which one does work, which one's true, which one's not true.
So can someone give me a number that's smaller than negative 2 they want to test? Negative 3. Okay. So we're going to test x equals negative 3. In between them, let's test 0. And this one, let's test positive 3. Can someone double check negative 3? Can someone check 0? And can someone check 3? And then let me know if it's true or false statements. Does it work or does it not work? And so what we're doing is legit just putting it back in to the original. I'm going to do 0. Now, again, if you get a decimal, that's fine. That's not our whole point. Our point is, is it true or not? So if the decimal is smaller than 1, great. If it isn't, then we, we have a problem. Okay, so if we're plugging in 0, that's the square root of 8 minus 3. Square root of 8 minus 3 is a negative number. So is a negative number smaller than 1? Yeah. I'm going to put a check mark there. That part's true. Did anyone test negative 3? Was that true or false? Negative did not work. Okay. And then did positive 3 work? No. Okay. So we have our section. Now be careful with the symbols uh, because we want to make sure that the numbers that we're plugging in are smaller than one, it can't be equal than one. So potentially one of them could be a bracket, one of them could be parentheses, depends on what you get when you input your answers. So we know it's gonna be from negative two to two. What happens if we plug in two in here? Two times four is eight, eight plus eight is 16, square root of 16 is four, four minus three is one. So two, is not included because that gives us a false statement, parenthesis. However, if we plug in negative 2, that gives us the square root of 0, which gives us 0 minus 3, which is negative 3. Is that smaller than 1? Yeah, so that means negative 2 is true, so we got to do a bracket. Now, if you don't want to do this type of notation, that's fine. You can do your other notation, which is going to be negative 2 less than or equal to x less than 2. I prefer this. To me, this is easier. This one's a little bit more complex for me. It could be the other way for you. Again, we are including negative 2 because it gives us a true statement when we plug it in. We are eliminating 2. We're not including 2 because it gives us a false statement. Okay, so that's solving equations and inequalities. Uh, let's go ahead and do inverses. We'll do two more things. We'll do inverses, verifying inverses, and then graphing. So three more things. Anyone still need more time on this? Okay, that's fine. Go ahead. This way? Yes, go ahead. Oh, there's more than this, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these questions are not the only questions on the test. Yeah. What other um, topics? So everything in the packet that I passed out for, I think it was homework number, what number are we on? 22, everything in homework number 22. Yeah. Give you a few more moments. Okay. Let's go and move on. So inverses. There are two questions for inverses. One of them is to identify the inverse, find the inverse, and then the other one is verify the inverse. So when you are solving for inverses,
that's where you switch your x's and y's. So for example, we have the fifth root of n minus 3 plus 8. Step number one is make your f of x, uh, in this case it was f of n, equal to y. You're going to switch your y and n. If you are uncomfortable with n, make it an x. That's not a big deal. So we got the fifth root of y minus 3 plus 8 is equal to x. So I made that switch. I'm just more comfortable with x. Uh, if you want to keep it as n, you're fine. Once you make the switch, though, please don't um, do the flip-flop. Don't flip it back. Yes, sir? So you're just changing the variable and you want to I am not doing a step. That is one of the steps. So originally, we had an n. That became a y. And then I have a y, and that became an x, just because I didn't like n. So if you wanted to keep it an n, you can. Normally, it would be an x and a y. Yeah, so if this one right here, since we have a function using n, this is now n. And I'll keep it as n. Mm -hmm. I don't mind keeping it as n. Once we make that switch, we're going to solve for our new y. So I'm going to remove that 8. And what's really good with inverses, beautiful people, is you don't actually have to expand anything. So, for example, I have to raise this to the fifth power. No one's asking you to use Pascal's triangle to expand this. Just leave it. Okay? So, we got n minus 8 raised to the fifth power. I'm going to add 3, add 3. So, for our inverse function, we have n minus 8 raised to the fifth power plus 3 equal to, and please do not put y. For your final answer, like in the middle of your work, that's fine. But we already know y is equal to something else. We can't set it equal to this. These are not the same thing. These are inverses. So we have to say, hey, this is the inverse function of f of n. Very important that you have your inverse notation. Also, please make sure your variables match. So if you originally made the switch to x, don't give me f of n. Give me f of x. Okay. So these two need to match. So if your variable is an n, your function is in terms of n. Okay, so that's finding inverses. I think finding inverses, you're okay. Uh, it was the composition of functions that we struggled with a little bit. Let me shift this up. And that is verifying. Now, just like I wrote in the uh, Are You Ready packet, that you must use composition of functions to verify inverses. If you use any other method, uh, and there is a different method to do this, that's not what we're doing. We're doing composition of functions. If you choose to use any other method, you will get absolutely no credit, even if the work is correct. This is called reading the directions, following the directions. Again, you must use composition of functions for these. Let's verify. f of x is equal to the fifth root of x minus 3 over 2. g of x is equal to 32 x to the fifth power plus 3. And again, we're verifying. Ah, I misspelled verify. So verify if they are inverses. To verify if they are inverses, using composition of functions, you have to do two things f of g of x must be equal to x and I don't have space to write here g of f of x needs to be equal to x if both are equal to x then yes inverses so if one of them equals to x fantastic it tells us nothing if one of them fails to equal x then yes, it tells us a lot in that no, they're not inverses. So let's go ahead and do it. f of g of x. That means we write out the f function first. I'm going to put parentheses. Where are my x's? And I usually write these, these pretty large. So if you need extra space on the test, let me know and we can provide you with paper. And then inside goes g of x, so 32x to the fifth power plus 3. 
And again, if they are inverses, things should just happen. For example, plus 3 minus 3, what is that equal to? Nothing. That's just 0. They go away. They're both inside the radical, so we can simplify inside the radical. We have the fifth root of 32x to the fifth power divided by 2. So we can, again, simplify by splitting this up. We have the fifth root of 32, and we have the fifth root of x to the fifth power. If you still need to write this in a um, rational exponent and do 5 divided by 5 as a fraction, you can. Or you can see that, hey, I have an exponent of 5, I have an index of 5. These go away. And then uh, fifth root of 32, anyone know that one? 2, thank you. And then we still have our divided by 2. So that means that the first one is x. What does that tell us, beautiful people? Nothing. Doesn't tell us anything yet. We got to do the other one. Hopefully, I have enough space to do it here on the bottom. We'll see. So we do g of f of x. So now g is first, so we're writing out g. Be careful with this because you are inputting a fraction. So I know some of you are going to be very tempted to just start crossing things out. Be careful. Because you have a fraction in here, that exponent of 5, yes, it does go on your numerator, but it also goes on your denominator. So be careful. So we have 32 times the fifth root of x minus 3 to the fifth power and 2 raised to the fifth power plus 3. So now we can do the index and the exponent. That goes away. 2 to the fifth power, I think you guys said the opposite, so I think that's 32. And I think I'm just going to make it with space. 32 times x minus 3. So we can divide that by 32, which gives us x minus 3 plus 3, which gives us x. Now that both equal x, we can say, yes, they are inverses. We're going to do one more beautiful people uh, for review, and that's going to be graphing. We have two graphing, and then I'll mention domain and range once one. Okay, anyone still need us on the board? Okay, go ahead, that's fine. For everyone else, I'm going to go ahead and read off the question. Go ahead and get started on graphing this. We're looking at 3 times, again, 3 times the square root of x minus 5 plus 2. And that's equal to f of x. Again, for those of you who are ready to move on, we have 3 times the square root of x minus 5 plus 2 equal to f of x. Please graph. Please graph. It's equal to f of x. Um, if you'd like y, you can set it equal to y, yeah. So again, 3 times the square root of x minus 5 plus 2, and that's equal to f of x. The first thing I want you to notice is you have a square root, not a cube root. A square root has limitations. You cannot have a negative underneath the radical. Okay, It becomes imaginary. So when we find our h comma k, this is our end point. 
So we have a positive 5 and a 2. This will be a restriction on the domain. And this will be a restriction on the range. Now, if it goes from infinity to negative infinity or, you know, direction-wise, you're looking at your leading coefficient. Your leading coefficient is positive. So you know the functions are going to be increasing. It's not going to be going downhill. It's going to be going uphill towards the right. And so that means we can already identify our domain and range without graphing it, without sketching it. Now, we do need to sketch this. But if it's asking you, there will be a question that's going to ask you for domain and range without graphing it. You always have to look at your h and k value for a square root. That's different for a cube root. Let's go ahead and graph this really quick. Uh, easiest thing to do is do a quick little x and y. Start off with your endpoint of two, uh, sorry, of five and two. Plug and chug some numbers. It is a square root. Yes, you can use a calculator for this. You got three parentheses. Uh, just kidding. We got three square root parentheses. And I know that I can't have a negative in here, so I probably wouldn't choose four. Instead, I'm going to choose six. So six minus five, close it, plus two, and I get five. For a square root, the minimum uh, quantity of points I am asking from you is two. You got your end point, you got your directional point, you're done. For a cube root, you need three because you need one, uh, since it's going both directions, you need one above the point of inflection and below. So for this one, it's just two. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, end point, six, and five. Now remember, a cube root and a square root will always point to the right and to the left while it's increasing or decreasing. So it's not a horizontal line that goes straight to the right. It kind of has an increasing slope as it goes to the right. So again, the domain for this will be from 5 and including 5 all the way up to infinity. And the range for this will be from 2 and including 2 all the way up to infinity for your domain and range on the square root. Now for a, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. So if you want to use inequalities, you can. So like y is uh, greater than or equal to uh, 5. And then we got y greater or equal to 2 if you want to do that one. And then the next one we have, the last one we're going to do for the review, is going to be your cube root. So let's do, where's the cube root? Ah, right here. Now again, the major difference between a square root and a cube root is that a square root does have limitations on its domain and range. A cube root does not. Again, remember, a cube root is Mr. John Travolta, but because uh, it's you know a root, we're going to just knock him over just a little bit so he's pointing to the right and to the left instead of up and down. So we still have our h and k, but now we have a point of inflection. And again, beautiful people, when graphing, I will not be giving you a B value, but expect a B value when you are describing a transformation. So when you're describing a transformation, make sure that you know that you need to factor out a B value. Here, we're just doing negative 8 and negative 5. Again, t-chart real quick. This is a cube root, so this is where it's a little bit more challenging. Uh, if you watched the last video, you can cheat a little bit with your calculator. Uh, if you have a very fancy calculator, I don't believe we're allowing those. I do have to confirm, but I don't believe we're allowing those. I think we're only allowing hours on the test. So you can do this by hand, which I recommend. So we have our point of inflection, negative 8, negative 5. I know I can take a cube root of 1, so I'm going to put in a negative 7. 
cube root of 1 is just 1. 1 times negative 2 is just negative 2. 5, 6, 7, I get negative 7. And then for this one here, I'm going to choose a negative 9. Negative 9 plus 8, negative 1. Cube root of negative 1 is negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 2 is a positive 2. Minus 5 is a negative 3. Minimum points required for a cube root is 3. Start off with your point of inflection, which is negative 8 and negative 5. Then we have negative 7 and negative 7. And then we have negative 9 and negative 3. When you graph these, it should look like you should have a straight line. But you know because of the parent function being a cube root, it's not a straight line, so we have to point to the right and to the left. Easiest way to do this is always put your marker or your pencil on the middle point, your point of inflection. Curve up and to the right and curve down, curve up, sorry, and to the left and curve down to the right. Again, these are increasing, decreasing functions. So this one's a, a decreasing function because we have a negative. So we're going to be going downhill. But as we're going down, we're also going to the left and to the right. So it shouldn't be fully straight. It should look like it's going a little bit more towards the like down area. And let's talk about domain and range. For a cube root, domain and range, super duper easy. It's never going to change. It's always the same. And that is all real numbers. So from negative infinity to positive infinity, from negative infinity to positive infinity. Cubic and cube roots will always be all real numbers. So if you want to write the words all real numbers, that's fine. If you want to write uh, the interval notation, that's also OK. Do we make it? We made it with two minutes. OK, beautiful people. I'm available during lunch if you still need me. Again, this is not everything that's covered. You will be asked everything on homework number 22. Fair game. How do I stop this? There it is.